is for you to partake of it and to benefit from it in so many areas. It has practical application. It is able to lift your spirit, your soul to higher places. So the things of this world do not have that great effect that it might have on others for not having faith in God or his word. Amen? Isaiah 53, we've been on this scripture. Now this is the third time that we've read from it. Speaking of the Messiah, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. I'd like to focus this morning on verse four. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Clearly, when we come to Christ, what is the anticipation? When you come to Jesus, when a person surrenders their life to Christ, what is the anticipation? Well, one uh, perhaps experience I myself had experienced when I came to the Lord is that he renews us to be born again a regeneration that takes place within the spirit. He heals us. Sometimes uh, God heals us of illness. Sometimes God heals us of a broken heart. Past experiences that were quite hurtful. Amen? He takes up our burdens. He infuses our spirit and body with divine peace. Have you experienced that with the Lord? In the past, what might have weighed us down, weighs us down no more. Have you experienced that as you walk with him? Again, verse 4 says, Surely he took up our pain and, and bore our suffering. In a world that is absent of Jesus, the world is burdened with confusion. And they call their confusion their version of truth. Self-truth is a world without absolutes, a world of relativism. A world without boundaries. It's a world of self-reliance. I depend on me, not on a God. The truth, unfortunately, and we're talking about world truth, meaning your truth, not God's truth, their truth perpetuates their pain. There's never an exit. There's never a way out. Their truth perpetuates their perversion. They continue in their sinful folly and the, and the things of this world. They, their truth perpetuates their confusion, their despair, their sadness, their addictions. When they decide only to acknowledge their truth. As a worldly person, I can be my own savior. As a worldly person, I can be my own God. And if I am all that there is, then I am also absent of a greater purpose. I live to pursue my own pleasures, my own happiness, sometimes at the expense of others. I suffer also with no hope after the afterlife. My guidance or direction is what will make me the most amount of wealth. That is where my focuses as an unbeliever. 
The scripture talks about the attitude of the unbeliever, and the scripture is, quote, let us drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Not very hopeful, is it? In addition with this, I have piled up my regrets, my offenses, my hurts, my loneliness, my sadness, my depression. My value is only what others have said or what they think of me. Surely I am on a descent, and my descent has led me to my own personal madness and despair. No need to worry, the end of the week is almost here, the end of a bottle. The swift section of a white line will surely improve my mental state. I will find someone to share, at least for a brief, promiscuous moment, an evening of emptiness. When we have finished our personal soiree, we will continue to live out our truth in darkness. In the book, The Seven Deadly Sins, Henry Farley made the statement, sin is the destruction of oneself as well as the destruction of others' relationships. I'm sorry, let me try that again. Sin is the destruction of oneself as well as the destruction of one's relationships with others. The unrepentant sinner lives with a hole in their heart and the emptiness is ever present because one is so aware. And this, my fellow human beings, is just the tip of the proverbial iceberg, for Jesus came to save us from more than the suffering experienced by living a sinful life. How many of you know that's true? He came to save us from an eternity separated from God, separated from heaven, separated from our loved ones bound toward heaven. Again, let me remind you of the scripture. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Jesus had taken upon himself the sins of the world, not just to save you from yourself upon this earth, to not just to save you from your own personal sinful expe expeditions, but to save us from hell. Matthew 25, 46 says this. He says, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. There are some people who believe in annihilation. The idea is, is that those who are bound toward heaven because of fulfilling the requirements, if you will, will go to heaven and later be perhaps brought down to earth. And then in, to accompany that, those who have been destined to die based on their chosen lifestyle will simply be annihilated, and so therefore they will cease from existing. And to some degree, they find comfort in the idea of being completely annihilated and no longer, the, the soul no longer exists. The only problem with that is that's not what the scripture teaches. Amen? Amen? He says in uh, Matthew 25, 46, then they will go away to eternal punishment. What is eternal? That's for heaven. but the righteous to eternal life. The word used for eternal is ionius. And this is the Vines Dictionary, uh, um, sorry, Vines Dictionary definition of the word ionius. Things which are in their nature endless. So is there an end to damnation? Is there an end to eternal life with Christ? And the answer obviously is no. So Jesus taking upon himself the sins of the world, being stricken by God, that wrath that Jesus endured was supposed to be for 
for us. But Jesus himself had decided to take our place, and he endured the wrath of his Father. He took your place. He paid the price so that you will never, you will never have to face the judgment of a holy God. Praise God. That's what he did for you today. Daniel 12, 1 says, and again in reference to eternity, at that time Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will rise. This is the Old Testament. There will be a time of distress, just as not has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Now we're talking about a book. Right? A book that has your name. The moment that you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Word of God makes it clear that a name is written in that book. My question to you is your name written in that book. Have you made the decision to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? Having also the understanding that you can do nothing to earn or deserve salvation. Amen? This is the reason why Jesus came. This is the reason why Jesus went to the cross. To pay the penalty for your sin. It's all paid for. Amen? And sometimes it's good to talk about eternity. So that we have a greater appreciation for what Jesus did on the cross. <coughs> My heart is full of gratitude because there was no way that I could fulfill all of the requirements of the Old Testament. The requirements of the law. Amen? So Jesus fulfills all those requirements for you and for me. And because he did that, and you then make a decision to come into agreement with what he's done for you and receiving him as your Lord and Savior, then your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. And then verse 2 says, Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life and others to shame and everlasting life. Again, that word everlasting. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. So those who lead others to Christ are considered wise. And there is a brightness that will be associated unto you on that day, according to the word of God. Amen? Matthew 13, 30 says, let both grow together. Again, talking about the harvest. The saved and the unsaved. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. The good stuff belongs to me. There's a separation. Amen? So God has saved us. God has delivered us from eternal damnation. A lot of times we don't talk about it. Maybe because it just isn't the right time. Uh, a lot of us don't talk about it because there's also other subjects that can be talked about when you're delivering a sermon. But sometimes when we don't talk about it at all, we, we fail to understand uh, and appreciate what Jesus has done so that we can escape yeah. judgment. Yeah. Right? And if we go back again to that verse, but he was, uh, uh, we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are now. That's beautiful to me. 
And I'll be honest, as a pastor, I, I always like to keep the, uh, a sermon pretty positive. Right? But I don't ever want to sacrifice truth for positivity, if you will. Just give people the truth. Let them process it. Right? This isn't my word, it's God's word. And if people follow God's word, then at that point, there's a promise of prosperity, success, in areas of life. And it's multifaceted in terms of how it can impact a person's life. See, first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So it has a multifaceted uh, impact, if you will, right? Deuteronomy chapter 6, and also chapter 17, it's important for us to see that what God has done is not only to save us, to deliver us, but he's also provided the word of God, his instruction to protect us, from unnecessary pain and suffering. Everyone say unnecessary, unnecessary. Pain, pain, pain and unnecessary, unnecessary. suffering. <laughs> How many of you know that some of the pain and suffering that we go through is self-inflicted? <laughs> Amen? And so the word of God has been given, up, given to us to avoid those experiences. Right? He's not a killjoy God. His desire was to, to offer us an instruction manual so that we can live this life in a way that would be uh, equal to what Jesus said. And he said, uh, "My, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. I want you to live the abundant life. I want you to have a, a, a great experience while you're, you are upon this earth. There is, however, necessary How many of you know what I'm talking about today? Right? So pain is good. How many of you have been to college? How many of you know that's, that's a necessary pain? <laughs> right? How many of you have run five miles? How many of you know that's a necessary pain? Right? Praise the Lord. Some of you have jogged and have exercised, and all of this can be classified as a necessary pain. But how many of you know that there are those who might walk away from God and backslide? And the Lord who loves you decides to bring upon your life a discipline. Why? Number one, because he loves you, right? He loves those, he disciplines those he loves. And the word of God in, in, the, in the book of Hebrews says it's for two main reasons. Right? So that you, after you've learned from the discipline, yeah. you will then bear more fruit. Right? Yeah. And number two, so that you will then share His holiness. That means He wants a deep, intimate relationship with you. And He knows that until He brings you through a period of painful experiences, perhaps you decide, you know what, I really don't need the Lord right now. I'm just kind of going to do my own thing and live out my sinful fantasies and, and do whatever it is that I want to do. And the Lord says, well, I, I see what you're doing. You're not, going to, you're, you're not going to hide that from me. You understand that, right? You know that the moment that you receive me as your father, that I am your father. And like a good father, there's going to be some discipline that I may have to administer unless you humble yourself or repent. Have you ever experienced that in your walk with God? Mm -hmm. Amen? I know I did. I came to a place in my life where I said, okay, Lord, I, you know, I, don't, I, I don't understand you. And I don't always agree with you. And I kind of want my life to go a different direction. I was in trouble. Amen? Just had to read those words because after I heard those words, actions follow. And I thought I was going to be able to get away from God and God's going to do his thing and I'm going to do my thing. But wait a second. He's my heavenly father. And I am his child. 
And I still remember to this day, I could never clear my conscience when I was living in disobedience to God. He rode me, praise God, like a master rodeo personality. Right? Here I'm thinking I'm going to buck God off. You know, I'm just going to shake him off and eventually he's going to leave me alone. And here's the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Right? Who got tired? Sure wasn't God. Sure wasn't the Holy Spirit. I got tired. And after a number of different circumstances that were quite painful, I then decided, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to live for him. Forgive me, Lord, for my sins. And cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I'm ready to get back on track. Amen? Amen. He has saved you from you. He has saved you. It's so, you know, I, I think to myself, if I had continued my, my life in the way that it was headed, I could have ruined not just my life, but the people around me. Amen? But on top of that, not only did he save me and deliver me and bring me out of my mire, brought me out of my pit, he increased my life with possibility, with anointing, with great inspiration and vision. There is a benefit in walking in obedience to God. There is a vision that he imparts into his people. There are dreams that you will have that you would not have had if you had continued to walk in darkness. How many of you know when, when you're walking in the light, the path is clear? When you're walking in darkness, you're going to stumble, you're going to fall, you're going to get bruises, you're going to be slapped in the face, amen, by those things that you did not foresee. But Jesus has come to save, to deliver, and to prosper, and to bring success to those who choose him. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Yeah. In Deuteronomy 6, let me just simply read this and we'll close with that. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord God directed me to teach you, to, uh, to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children. Did you capture that? From generation to generation. And their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy a long life. What's the benefit? Living a long life. Does it sound good to you? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you. What's the second benefit? That it may go well with you. Living a long life, that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Long life, what's the second one? That it will go well with you. And the third one, that you may increase greatly in the land that you live. That sounds like a pretty good plan, don't you think? You like that? I like that. Where do I sign up? Praise God. Amen? Verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Don't keep it to yourself. Amen? Talk to your kids about it. Let them know why you're excited about God. Let them know of the importance of why it's, of why it's important to, to, to walk in obedience to the Lord. Amen? Amen? Don't hold it back. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them to symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. The word of God should be 
all around you. Amen? We need to be mindful of it. If we are to experience God's bountiful blessing. Why is that important? Uh, Joshua said, meditate, or uh, the Lord said unto Joshua, meditate on my word day and night, and you will have prosperity and success. Right? That's how important it is. Why? Because every single day you wake up, you are wrestling with your flesh. Amen? Amen? There is something inside of you that's contrary to the word of God. And this is the reason why it's so important to surround ourselves, hallelujah, with good Christian people. Because usually what comes out of good Christian people is the word of God that flows from their mouth. Amen? I get encouraged when I'm hanging out with you people. Some of you uh, are good friends of mine. And I enjoy hanging out with you. Why? Because you left me up. You encourage me. I, I also uh, I also work with secular people. I love them. I like them, but it's not the same. Amen? My desire is that one day they also will come to a place of knowing him. But praise God. Last night I was watching Chosen. Most of you, I'm sure, have seen that movie. And you know, there's a number of different shows and movies to watch on, you know, the, the number of different um, stream, uh, streaming that's available. And I can watch, I sometimes I like watching action movies too. But they, they don't really do a whole lot in terms of building up my spirit. Amen? And I like a good action movie because I'm kind of an action man myself. <laughs> I just enjoy adventure, amen? And so when a movie uh, comes up uh, that might have some adventurous theme, I like watching it. But it never does anything for my spirit, can I hear it amen? But when I watch Chosen, I watched it twice already, and I've had some friends who have heard, hey, you gotta see this, you gotta see this. Yeah, I've been around to it. And I just kind of uh, procrastinated. But the two times that I watched it, I thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. You know, the faith that begins to build up within the heart. The expectation of God being God when you meditate on the story of Jesus and, and what he did. Uh, watching last night the, the creation, uh, the miracle of, of uh, the wine. When they ran out of wine uh, for a wedding feast. And uh, mom approached Jesus and said, hey, they're embarrassed. <laughs> there should be more wine than there isn't. Uh, maybe you can help us out here, basically. And Jesus reminded her, hey, listen, it's not my time. And he just, and she just kind of looks at him. And he says, okay. And he does this wonderful miracle. And I think to myself, you know, I walked away from that thinking to myself, boy, he's caring. Something as, at least from my perspective, as non-essential. You run out of wine, you run out of wine. If you run out of Pepsi, you run out of Pepsi. No big deal. But there is a certain amount of importance that these people have placed upon uh, being hospitable to their guests. And he took the time to perform his first miracle. Mm -hmm. Amen? And I think to myself, this is the God that we serve. And all it did really, truly, is encourage my faith and encourage my um, perception of Jesus and how much he loves and cares for you and me, even in the smallest things. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. But in the big things, the the man God went to the cross to die for your sin. I mean, talk about nothing is too big or too small for you. Wow. He went to the cross for you and me. He bled and he died for you and me. What does that say about Jesus? What does that say about me? 
At this stage of my life, my walk with God, I say, Lord, I want to live my life in a way that pleases you. One day, I'm not going to be here anymore. And here's the, 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 the assurance that I have. For my sins, God, who is holy, punished Jesus. Because that was what Jesus decided to do. This is what God decided to do. This is what the Holy Spirit decided to do. And so when I breathe my last, you know, here's, here's the, the, the wonderful truth. I will not be fearful of the transition. Amen? Amen? I was also looking at the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And we talked about it before. But when Lazarus died, the word of God says that there were angels, plural, that escorted him into the presence of God, Abraham's bosom. Angels. Can you imagine that? The moment you breathe your last, Jesus has already determined an escort for you. And it will not be a fearful experience. For the moment you breathe your last, there before you will be these grandiose, beautiful angels. And will say to you, it's time. You are about to see him face to face. And to hear the Lord say, well done, that good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Wow. You know, I once, I said I was going to close, didn't I? <laughs> All right, for sure, this time for sure. I remember thinking about that experience, you know, what would it be like? to transition from this life to the next. And I imagine, of course, being ushered in with these angels, standing before Jesus and seeing him in the fullness of his glory, and at least for a moment, was caught up in this euphoric state of seeing him in his glory. And I think to myself, you know, the angels worship him. And they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, our God. And they do this 24-7. And the part that's interesting to me is that at no point does it say that you even get tired of doing it. There's just something so magnificent about the presence of God, the presence of Jesus. That they just keep singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Amen. Almighty. Right? And I think to myself, the moment that I walk into the presence of God, and you've heard that song, um, if I can only imagine, will I dance before him, will I cry before him, will I bow before him? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but I can imagine myself completely being enraptured and captivated by his presence. That I could probably be there for 10 years and not even know the difference. But I think to myself, and this is what came to my mind as I was imagining this, because I will be so transfixed with the presence and the image of Jesus himself, that at a certain point the Lord will have to say, now go find your loved ones. Go find those ones, your family. Maybe your spouse, your former spouse, your mom, your dad. Remember those eyes that look deeply into yours? Go look for that. And can you imagine the angels as they're watching this family reunion? Your eyes are bouncing from one face onto another. Where is she? Where is he? joy, 
the glory of the person who preceded you in death. And how it brings joy to the Lord to see you reunite with your loved ones. Amen? This is what he paid for. He says, where I go, you will be with me also. And I am preparing a place for you. And how many of you know Jesus is preparing a place for you? It's going to be a special place. Amen? Amen? Remember, he was a carpenter. Oh, there's no telling what he's built already. Amen? Just for you. And I thank the Lord for those promises. Praise God. Let's stand together. Father, we're so thankful, Lord God, for your presence. We're so thankful, God, for your word. Lord, your word is glorious. I desire, Lord, more of it. I hunger for it. I thirst for it, God. I pray that we would all share the same desire. If you're here this morning, you've not received Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know in your heart it's time. I need you, Jesus. If that's you with your head bowed and eye closed, just raise your hand and say, pray for me. I, I need him. I've been walking without him for quite some time. Anybody here? just bask in the revelation of this word this morning. Hallelujah. Let's raise our hands toward heaven as we utter the Lord's blessing this morning. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord's face shine upon thee and be gracious to thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give you his peace. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week. We have Darwin Benjamin next week with the evangelist. You don't want to miss that.